Well, welcome to session six, uh, 13 on the Westminster Confession of Faith. And we're looking at the chapter, uh, chapter six, which is called Of the Fall of Man, of Sin and the Punishment Thereof. Sorry, we're back in my study again. I recorded uh, the last couple I recorded. There were um, mistakes made by me um, and has recorded so didn't have sound and such like. Um, so hopefully this will be the last time you see my study especially it's in a bit of a mess so of the fall of man of sin and the punishment thereof and this actually this is the last one we're going to do for quite some time um we've got various other people coming on midweeks i'm on sabbatical in fact um which is why i might not be completely coherent and um you might think well, that's not a very cheery place to to end on uh, surprisingly you'll find it's very um practical um and chapter and also one with some some hope in it as well now, um, because it's just me talking to a microphone and looking into a camera, there's no interaction. But what I did when we did this for real was ask the question, why is this useful? So perhaps a few times when I get to these points, just pause. I know some of you uh, watch this together um, if you've been away uh, so you can have a chat with each other. But why is this useful? We'll think a bit more about that at the end. OK, so. Uh, 6.1 I'll read to you our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptations of Satan sinned in eating the forbidden fruit this their sin God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit having purpose to order it to his own glory so they start by talking about how sin comes into the world in the first place and the Bible, the, the Bible cross-references they use, they just use the ones that talk about it as a very matter-of-fact um, event. It's taken as historic and uh, as a moment in time. There is this point when it happened. They don't expand it in ways they could do, so they could talk about covenant and so on. We will come to covenant later. Uh, they don't do that here. And uh, the second sentence puts it into a larger framework. Uh, because it talks about God having purposed it in order to his own glory. Um, so they're, they're linking this into what we've already thought about in chapters 4 and 5. So I'm tempted to always look out the window because a lot of building work and clattering going on. Hopefully you can't hear it. So it, the way it links in with 4 and 5 with um, um, God's decree, creation, um, providence and so on. Romans 11.32 For God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So we thought about mystery in the previous sessions. Um, the point here is those God does not introduce sin. He's not the author of sin. He does not approve of sin. Uh, long term, he still uses sin. And here specifically, he uses sin, which incurs his judgment in order that he might to some show mercy. 6.2 by the sin they fell from their original righteousness and communion with god and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all their faculties and parts of soul and body so when we talk about the fall as we often do um fall from what uh, in what way are we are we fallen and the answer is here um, from our original righteousness and communion with god so Genesis 3, 8, Adam and Eve hide from God. After they, that first act of disobedience, the first thing they do is, is hide. Ecclesiastes 7 and Romans 3 and many other um, passages in the Bible, particularly thinking of the, of the Psalms, affirm humanity's original uprightness and communion with God. So sinning is not essential to being human. Okay, Sinning is not essential to being a human. Uh, people think, well, I, I'm only human. That's why we sin, is because I'm only human. Um, the first humans wouldn't have initially sinned. We won't sin in the new creation. So sinning is not essential to humanity. That's important because often people talk about, well, I, I'm made that way. Why did God make me this way? Um, and then he's going to blame me for it. That's not how it is. So I, I know of someone who has um, serious anger management issues, and he says, well, that's just the way I am. And, of course, there's other sins that well that's a very typical thing i'm made this way now we're not made with sin that's something that's introduced later um and we'll come 
more to how sin seems almost like it's what we're like um, but it's not quite um, so essentially we were upright and um, in communion with God but we've fallen from it we've fallen from that status and that means a, a few things it means a couple of things at least first it means we become dead uh, we're dead so in 217 it's just stated you will die and someone's described it as a slow death what does it mean uh, by that well it means you will die in the conventional sense your faculties conk out um, but also in Ephesians 2 1 it means we're unresponsive we're spiritually dead we don't you know like like dead people don't respond uh, spiritually we don't respond we need to be made alive and secondly it says defiled all in all faculties what does that mean well uh, Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can understand it so sin affects everything and it including our, our conscience our thoughts our motives um, so we sometimes talk about the noetic effect of the fall effect of our knowing effect of how we think but also affects our bodies how we use so it starts obviously in our thinking our minds and um, then it works out into our bodies at, um, we use our bodies for sin we use our eyes and ears which are Although they're passive, they bring information in. Uh, we listen out, we look out for for sin. And our hands and our feet move towards sinful actions. And the result of that is our bodies are heading towards decay. And so you can see that with me. If you've got HD, you can see my grey hairs. You can see um, I'm wearing glasses, I'm, I'm decaying. Um, and total depravity means that I'm fallen in every area of my life. doesn't mean I'm as bad as I possibly could be. I'm bad all the time, but I'm fallen in every area. So uh, we we are all, in some way, sexual sinners. We're not committing the same sexual sins, but we are all sexual sinners. We're all uh, financial sinners. We're all this. We're all in some way greedy, and and so on. Not in the same way. Not all the time. Not as bad as we could be. But every department, if you like, of our life, is fallen. That's what total depravity means. And notice we're fallen from communion with God. And our original uprightness but we're still in god's image even if that image is now distorted now at this point when i did this and the recording didn't work uh, i did open up for any questions so um i don't know how you're going to do that uh put some questions in the in the caption box and um see if someone gets back to you or whatever but you might have some questions at this point so what we've looked at so far 6.1 6.2 is been a lot about adam and eve and the origins of sin but how does that affect us a long time later 6.3 they being the root of all mankind the guilt of this sin was imputed and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity descending from them by ordinary generation so sin their sin is imputed to us so that means it is considered ours i wasn't there i didn't um, do that but it is um, in a sense I did because it is considered mine when Adam and Eve fell specifically when Adam fell it's interesting they say our first parents but um, in the rest of scripture it's Adam who singled out because Adam is the federal head the, the head of the covenant we see that often don't we that God deals with one person and in that one person he's dealing with many uh, that they represent so Adam is represents all humanity the solution then is we need a new head and we need to be someone who's going to succeed where adam failed and we need to be imputed with his status now actually there's a very simple little thing you can you could pause here and go onto our website and uh it's um there's a thing about explaining the gospel that explains the gospel and um, there's a thing called 321 that glenn scrivener did explains really these two heads very simply so when did i first sin when did you first sin can you think back well i can tell you when you first sinned um when adam sinned his sin is mine and it passes to me rather than a genetic disorder passed down by your parents it's it's passed through this imputing considering because he's my head but but well, he was but it does then pass on to their descendants by ordinary generation so psalm 51 verse 5 uh, so to everyone who's born in an ordinary way 
they're going to get this in. Psalm 51 verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we're sinners from the womb, and we're born in a way that is in opposition to God. So when we say children are innocent, well, relatively speaking, and they may be innocent of certain things, but as every parent knows, you teach a child how to share. You don't have to teach them how to snatch. So, so far we've thought about original sin, so where sin comes from, the original sin in us and how we're born in opposition to God. Um, but that original sin and corruption leads to actual sin. So, 6.4. From this original corruption, whereby we're utterly indisposed, disabled and made uh, opposite to all good and wholly inclined to evil, do precede all actual transgressions. Uh, this is worth looking at those um, Bible references in your own time. But original sin, when, you talk, when they talk about original sin, they don't mean that it was the first sin that was, or there's something original about it, um, but it all sin originates from it. It's the stem and the root of all sin. And original sin leads to actual sins. They're distinct things, but you can't separate them. So here's an example from James 1, 14 to 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own sinful desire, or sorry, by his own desire. Then desire, when it's con uh, conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives brings forth death. So there's some things I'm just not tempted to do. There's some sins I'm not tempted to do, but let's be ridiculous for a moment. Um, I'm not tempted to eat bricks. So why am I tempted to do some things and not others, and at certain times and not others? Why does temptation tempt me? Jesus experienced temptation, but it doesn't lead him to sin. But what James is saying there is that my original sin lures me. And so it's the hook that there's the bait and the hook for me, my original sin, that then leads to actual sin. But I'm accountable for that. I'm accountable for the choices and decisions and actions that I make. Now, all we've said so far is uh, general, but what about the Christian who might be feeling terrible about this by, by now? 6.5. This corruption of nature during this life does remain in those who are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. So we will get to the good news uh, next time, I'll begin to, and look at how Jesus deals with our sin. But how are we to consider our sin? Now, you may notice that you still have some. If you don't notice that, then you are deluded and need to listen up. The uh, Christian relationship with sin has changed, but it remains. So there is a battle. So if you are not battling with sin, it means a couple of things. Either it means that you are giving in to sin and sinning, blissfully unaware, or you're dead and now in glory. Otherwise you're battling, which is what most of us are doing. So it's essential that we're honest, and although it is pardonable, and it's pardonable if we're honest, even though it's pardonable, it is just as sinful. So John 1, 8 to 10, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And it's worth reading all of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two to see the whole context there. But what you're saying there is, look, if you think you don't sin, you're just, just kidding yourself. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but if you do confess your sin, when you sin, then there's means of cleansing and start of chapter two explains that with jesus dying as the propitiation of our sin so that's good news and uh before we get to the really good news of how we're forgiven it, it assures us that the fact we see sin in our life and in one another's lives is actually normal christian experience it's still sin and notice it still needs to be mortified 
uh, the power of sin is greatly diminished, um, but we will still experience some. 6.6. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God and contrary thereunto, does in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God, the curse of the law, and made subject to death, with all miseries spiritual, temporal, and eternal. So although we rejoice in forgiveness, it's worth remembering that forgiveness is needed. Sin leads to consequences, and here they say the consequences are misery. Misery in this life, spiritual, we might say psychological, emotional, um, and eternal. So both in this life and the next, if you're not forgiven, uh, it'll be misery in the next life. But either way, misery in this life. Now, some evangelicals say that, uh, and it's very popular when I was a teenager, uh, they say that all sin is equal. So to commit one sin is to commit all sins, which is true. Uh, so all sin is equally ev evil and so on. Uh, clearly, that's not the case. Uh, clearly, scripturally, some are considered more serious, even if it's just for the consequences or for their uh, what they're stating in sort of high handedness against God. So not all sin is equal, but it's worth noting that all sin leads to death. So all sin is very serious. Now, the Roman Catholic view of sin, and probably this idea that all sin is equal, is a, what we do is we swing the pendulum right the other way. Uh, the Roman Catholic view of sin is that there are um, mortal and venial sins. So some that are um, very serious and some that are less serious. So they talk about the seven deadly sins. There are not seven deadly sins. All sin is deadly. All sin leads to death. So... Um, in one sense, we shouldn't be singling out sins as the ones to avoid, just avoid sin. Now, I'll give you some definitions, some we've talked about already, and some of these they don't talk about directly in the confession, but I think are quite helpful. So one of them is total depravity. We've talked about all areas are affected by sin and we're fallen, even if we're not as bad as we could be, and we're still in God's image. Um, sin, in the Old Testament, the word chatta, uh, in the New Testament, hamartia means missing the mark. Uh, it can mean missing the mark. It can mean general for everything to do with sin. Um, miss it, so it's actually originally an archery term, missing the mark. So the idea is you've you've hit the crossbar, you've missed the target, you have sinned. So sinning is falling short of a standard that God has set. Some English translations also have the word transgress or trespass or something like that. And that's translating the Old Testament word pesha. Sometimes we just have the word sin, but there's a different Hebrew word. And that's about the deliberateness. So one is about here's the target and we hit there. This is a deliberateness. Here's the target I'm aiming there kind of thing, the crossing the line. And the New Testament uses various words for this, like ungodly, ungodliness, lawlessness, and uh, and so on. Uh, there's a word that's often translated iniquity in the Old Testament uh, our one, which is about staining or guilt. So it could mean that my feeling of guilt or it could be my legal status of guilt. Uh, but this idea also that I am I am guilty, even when I'm born, I'm stained. There's uh, something now corrupt in me. Uh, Augustine used this um, phrase of being curved in on ourselves. That's what sin is, is curving in on ourselves. As I saw in a children's talk once, sin is spelt with I in the middle it's like a twig but it gets to the point doesn't it so we finished about here i left people with some questions but a great discussion actually and um you if you're watching with someone else then obviously you can have a great discussion but here's some things for you to think about all this stuff about sin and and about the noetic effect of sin as well how does this affect how we do evangelism i will ponder about that how, do, how does it affect how we do evangelism does it how does this affect the way we think and how we think about how we think? So the stuff about sin, how does it affect how we think and how we think about how we think? Being self-conscious about that. And how does what we thought about, how does it help us with feelings of guilt? Well, um, that's 
what we discussed um, when the recording didn't work you can put um, comments in the box you can, you can like it you can share it if you use any ghastly social media um, and hopefully next time we do this um, it will be the recording has worked and it will be live although I now pause for people have questions tune in for the next one